Hey guys, I know a lot of you watch my channel because you've got the itch and you're looking to make your next knife purchase, which I totally get because I'm also a knife guy. So I invite you to open the description of the video you're watching right now and click here on my Amazon store where I've compiled some of my very favorites. As you can see, my most recommended knives and my favorite budget knives are right at the top, but there's also categories like knife maintenance, pocket clips, knife storage and display, and then a whole bunch of knives by popular brands. There's something down here for everybody, so make sure you take a look. Thanks. What's going on YouTube Metal Complex here and welcome to my top 20 favorite folding knives of all time. Hey Metal Complex, didn't you do another video like this? Yeah, I did. I did one seven months ago and since then I've reviewed five knives a week consistently for seven months. That equates to somewhere between 120 and 140 additional knives that I've handled. That's a lot of knives. So. My opinions have changed. I will likely do a couple of these types of videos a year just to kind of update people on my thoughts. What qualifies you to say that these are absolutely the top 20? Nothing really. I'm just a guy who's handled a ton of knives and I'm going to share my thoughts with you. I don't like these iPad episodes. I want to see you actually handling the knives. Every single knife that's on this list, I've actually done a review of physically on this channel that you can go back and find really easily by just typing in Metal Complex and the knife you want to see or looking through my playlist. So what are these based on, right? What I mean, like, is it value? Is it usage? Is it, it's just everything, right? It's just my own personal preferences based on value, based on, you know, how, what, how I felt when I handled it, my own personal opinions when it comes to aesthetics and materials, etc. Are there any budget knives in here? No, there are not because I have a separate video that I do for uh, budget knives. You can actually check that out. I did that one here recently. So this one is price not considered. It's just everything that I have found that I've loved. The top 20 knives that I've found that I love above all other knives that I have ever handled. Some things have remained the same and some things have changed, but without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into it. By the way, you can support me on Patreon. There's a link down in the description. Uh, number 20, the Cold Steel American Lawman. I've always said that this is just one of the best value knives all the way around. It's not really a budget knife. It's not really, it's not really a high-end knife. These are S35 uh, VN and G10. And as much as I, you know, rag on the, the triad lock, um, this is like the user supreme. You know, if you need more from your knife than what you can get from the Cold Steel American Lawman, you need a fixed blade or a shovel or a hammer or a pry bar or a bazooka or whatever. You know, uh, the Cold Steel American Lawman is ground well. It's got a forward choil. It's not ultra compact, but it's, it's not huge either, right? It's got a good pocket clip, ambidextrous clip, right? And the Colts, the, the Triad Lock is one of the strongest locks out there. I mean, for what these run now, um, they're, they're really great choices, absolutely. You can actually find this knife down in my Amazon store um, under uh, Cold Steel Knife. So if you want to pick this one up for yourself, you can. Moving on here, number 19. I don't think this is going to be a big surprise for a lot of people. The Benchmade Super Freak. Um, after the Hoag Ritter kind of took the place of the Benchmade Griptilian, a lot of people are like, those are two different knives. The Hoag Ritter and the Benchmade Griptilian are basically the same knife, right? Um, there was kind of a void left for a little bit. And uh, I've talked about this before, but the Benchmade Super Freak, in my opinion, not only remains to be um, one of Benchmade's best knives, but I, I think it's one of the best knives ever. CBM M4 and multi-layer G10 with red aluminum standoffs. It's got an open body construction, fantastic blade grind. If you can carry a knife of this size in your area, you know, if it's legal, um, this knife screams performance all the way around. It's only downfall is it uses the Omega Springs, which is a downfall of all Benchmade knives and any knives that are using Omega Springs right now, but it, it's not really something that I think people need to worry about as much as they do. Um, the Super Freak, in my opinion, is absolutely worth the money, and you can pick it up down again in my Amazon store under Benchmade Knives. Moving on here to number 18, the Spyderco Capara. I did not think that I would like this knife. For whatever reason, I have this weird thing where I'm like, but it says Taiwan on the blade. I, I don't know why I'm like that, because they clearly, their manufacturing quality is clearly supreme. Um, this is the uh, CQI updated version, the one that falls shut. I had the pleasure of handling this one on my channel. This is basically, to me, it was like all the things that I didn't like about the PM2 were fixed in this version. A lot of, I mean, there's not a lot of people who directly compare the Capara or the Capara with the PM2, but I do. It was slimmed down, not quite as tall, right? The blade grind was a little bit more attractive to me. The overall lines were more attractive. It's contoured. It's got some extra flair with the red, um, the red uh, backspacer. It's got the, the nice large size hardware. That's not really an upgrade. The only thing that was a little, little bit off about it was the fact that 
it's uh, the the thumb hole is not as accessible as the PM2, but still a nearly perfect knife. Absolutely, you can pick this one up in my Amazon store under Spyderco knives. You guessed it. Moving on here at number 17, the Benchmade Mini Crooked River. This might be Benchmade's best knife right now. And the only reason that I'm putting it above the Benchmade Super Freak is because it's part of the Benchmade custom shop uh, thing, right? And rejoice. All these people are like, oh, I don't like that diamond wood. A lot of people like the diamond wood. If you're like me, you're like orange and wood. Ugh. I live in Midwestern Kansas, so this looks like the country and hunting season to me, which is everywhere. It's everywhere I look in Kansas. It's, everything is just always orange and camo and wood, right? It's fine, and I grew up in the middle of this. You know, I can walk five minutes in any direction. I'm in the country, but ah, this is, I don't really like this look. The, the Benchmade Custom Shop allows people to not only get the steel they want between uh, D2, S30V, M4, 20CV, S90V, and Dama Steel, you can also change the color of the bolster, the color of the, the pivot collar, the color of the scales, the color of the backspacer, whether or not it's got a DLC coating. Oh my gosh. This is, I, I think this might just be Benchmade's best knife. And guess what? You can pick it up down in my description. Now, if you want to um, customize, you're going to have to go to the Benchmade Custom Shop, which is what I'd recommend anyway. Moving on here to number 16, the only OTF, sadly, that's on the list. I know a lot of people just cleared out. Uh, this is the um, Guardian Tactical Recon 35. Oh, my gosh. Um, this, this knife changed the name of the game for OTFs. This is an American-made OTF. Yes, I know there are some budge, budget OTFs out there. What about the Lightning? What about the Cobra? Whatever, what Reptilian? What? No, I don't. Listen, the Lightning's okay for a budget OTF. We're not talking about budget knives today, but in my opinion, there is a massive difference between a cheap Chinese-made OTF and an American-made premium OTF. They are not in the same place as the high-quality Chinese-made folders or the, the Chinese budget folders. Like, in the folder world, it's a really foggy line in terms of quality between a $50 quality budget knife and a $250 American production knife. Like, ugh, it's getting harder and harder to justify that money. When it comes to OTFs, no. Ha -ha. There's the Lightning in the budget world and maybe some other ones. And then, like, leaps and bounds ahead of it when you get up into the $250 to $500 range for OTFs. You know, and people are like, oh, that's a lot of money. I'm not saying you have to. I'm saying there is a huge difference in quality, in materials, fit and finish, execution, grinds in the blade, everything. Massive difference. So no, I'm not. I'm not going to consider that right now. Give, give me, you know, give the OTF world in the budget range a year or two to catch up, and maybe. But as of right now, this is the best value OTF that's out there, and it's also executed perfectly. It's just about eight inches long and about 3.3 to 3.4 inch blade. Oh, it's wonderful. Uh, these use S35VN, LMAX, and the 6061 T6 aluminum, but they've got a steel plate under the switch and ceramic bearings under the switch, making it super easy to um, to uh, deploy. Uh, also, the uh, the firing switch is non-symmetrical. It's actually shaped to um, allow you to gain traction whether you're pushing it forward or pulling it back. It's got a different... Uh, different slope on either side of it, and it's a wonderful EDC option for an OTF, and it's also, um, it's built incredibly well, very, very durable, durable. Um, absolutely deserving of the number 16 spot. Moving on here, number 15, one that's not going to surprise anybody, the Hogue Ritter. Um, this knife, in, in my opinion, has absolutely replaced the Benchmade Reptilian. Um, the entire construction overall is better. The blade shape is better. The grind is better. Um, the fit and finish on the knife is better. The, uh, the the knife has, in my opinion, a better combination of contouring and texturing on the scales. Everything is just nicer. The pocket clip, I mean, everything. And then on top of that, it costs less. This is a Knife Works exclusive. I think I accidentally say Knife Center sometimes. I think it's Knife Works exclusive. Uh, if you want to pick this thing up, uh, they run like 159 for M390 and just a perfect execution. I mean, this is, in my opinion, this is still the point of diminishing returns for American production knives. Like it's really hard to justify at every dollar you spend more than this on another knife, it's really hard to justify, you know, what that's going towards. This is an excellent knife. I own it, I use it, it's amazing. Moving on to number 14, the Spyderco Para 3. Um, the only reason that this knife is not higher on the list is because of the pocket clip. Everybody knows about the position of the lanyard hole in the pocket clip, right? That's a problem. What about the lightweight? That one solves all the problems. I don't like FRN. 
Uh, the lightweight's a great knife. I just don't like FRN. So the Para 3 on this list list is for the G10 version. I, honestly, in my opinion, it's, it's worth buying this knife and then upgrading the pocket clip to the MXG deep carry clip, which is, that's literally what's in my pocket right now. Can you see the silhouette? And then there's the MXG deep carry clip right there. Um, it's worth doing that. Yeah, it's gonna spend, it's gonna cost a little bit extra money, but oh my goodness, the compression lock, the size of this knife, the weight of the knife, you know, the construction. I mean, it's just, it's one of the most perfect EDCs out there and it's still not gonna break the bank, even if you do pay extra money for the pocket clip. Wonderful, wonderful design. Moving on here to number 13, another one returning from the old list. This one came out of left field for me. This is the Archbishop 2.0 by Ferrum Forge, and I believe we. Oh, man. A lot of you know what I refer to as Excalibur, like the perfect knife. This is really, really close to that. Um, you have a, co a combination between flipper and sort of thumb hole or finger hole opening, right? Forward choil, jimping on the back of the blade, contour titanium scales, gear pattern backspacer. Unfortunately, I think these are T6 screws. If they were T8, it would have been. There's only two things holding this knife back, in my opinion, from being absolutely perfect. Um, well, it could have external stops. I always bring that up. But T6 screws, if those were upgraded to T8 on the body, and then if the, the handle was textured. I know they do have textured ones, but those are the ones that are textured are not contoured. I want contouring and texturing. I just do. That's just me, my own personal preference. In any case, this is still a wonderful knife. I believe these are 20 CV or M390, same composition, just crucible versus bowler. Wonderful, wonderful knife. Unfortunately, I don't think they're widely available anymore. The ones that are, the ones that aren't contoured. Uh, for the money, they're just fantastic. I was blown away. I love Ferrum Forge and I love Wii, which I, somebody correct me if I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure Wii makes those uh, for Ferrum Forge, but I just did not expect for them to just nail it on every front with this knife. Amazing. Just slightly ahead of it at number 12, the ZT 0562 Ti. You guys knew this was going to be on the list. This is still one of the best knives that's out there. Um, the only thing that this knife is missing is contouring and texturing. It has the external stops, right? For whatever reason though, the overall execution of this knife feels just a little bit better. It's a little bit bigger. It feels more like a Hinder XM18 to me, which is, that's my bias coming out. You guys know I love the XM18, right? Everything about this knife other than those things is just perfect. It is expensive, but it's US made. It is 100% one of ZT's best knives that they have ever built only surpassed by one, which, spoiler alert, is gonna be on this list. Excellent, excellent knife. Moving on to number 11, one that I think that'll uh, surprise a lot of people, the Umnumzan. That wasn't on your list last time, and you had already reviewed it by the time you made that list, or handled it, at least you said that you had handled it. I had. I had handled the Umnumzan, and it hadn't made my list. And then my thought process changed a little bit. On my last list, I'm gonna tell you guys, this is the only Chris Reeve knife that's on the list. Um, I have not handled the 31 yet, soon, right? I've handled the Inkosi, and I love the Inkosi. But then my buddy Jeff sent me a, an Um Numzan that I could actually review on the channel, which was after I did my last list, and I handled it again, and I thought, you know what? I think I do like the Um Numzan a little better than the Inkosi. I love the Inkosi, and it's a great knife, and just because it's not on this list doesn't mean that I wouldn't recommend it, because I do. There are a lot of knives that I recommend that are not on this list, but rest assured, I do recommend the Inkosi. The Umnumzan, I think, is just a little bit better. Um, it's got the external stops, it's got texturing, it's got the ceramic ball interface, which is a lot, functions a lot like a seal lock bar insert, but probably better. Ergonomics are fantastic. Just a couple of quirks on this thing. Um, you know, not the, the action's not what I want, you know, versus a knife like nowadays, but that doesn't mean that it's not good. It's just me wanting a fidgety action. In terms of a functional work knife, it's really hard to argue outside of the Umnims on. And they're for the most part available. And on top of that, it's a it's an attractive looking knife. It's very easy to break down. 100 percent worth it. Very expensive, but very, very worth it. Moving on slightly ahead of this one, basically because of aesthetics, number 10, the Chavez 229 Ultramar. Oh, oh, talk about a knife that just speaks to me aesthetically. Pocket clips polarizing, I get it. Some people do not like that clip, I do. It gives this knife character. It, whether you like these or not, the Chavez 229 Ultramar is immediately recognizable. Everybody knows it. M390 bearings, you've got the big chunky titanium. This is, so I used to have a 228 Mid-Tech, which is a more expensive version of this knife. These knives are, Upgrades in every way from the old 228 mid-tech. Uh, the grinds are better, the um, the overall feel, the overall fit and finish, and the, the 228 was a good knife, right? 
But this is just, oh, it's just bigger and better and not bigger. I'm sorry. It's actually a little bit thinner, but everything just feels more refined, right? It's kind of like what happened here with the Corvette recently. Like the most recent generation that was available of the Corvette was good, but then they got this new mid-mount version. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. I mean, you may not like the change, you know, the, the different executions in terms of the aesthetics and, you know, where, where, where the power comes from, etc. But you can't deny it's just, a, it's just a better performing product. That's the case of the 229. Uh, love it. I don't know how available they are right now, but if you have an opportunity to get, a, get your hands on one, you, you absolutely should. Uh, moving on here to number nine, the Strider SNG. This one surprised me too. I've always assumed that the Strider SNG was just too basic for the money. Um, I was like, what could be so great about this? They're not even that good looking, right? The weird butt and the weird blade and the cutting edge to overall length ratio. And then I got one in hand and I got it all at once. These are very, very purpose-built knives. The ergonomics are off the charts. In fact, I, I'm going to go so far as to say this is probably the best ergonomic experience that I've ever had with a knife. Um, I get it. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking to spend money on a high-quality tool that will last you forever and you put ergonomics above everything else, the Strider SMG is absolutely the knife for you. I, I love this knife. The ergonomics go a long ways with me. That is a big deal. Speaking of ergonomics, moving on to number eight, one that I put only slightly ahead of the Strider, and that's the Spyderco Shaman, aka the Strider Co. Very similar to a Strider SMG. The reason I put this knife above the Strider is it's not only, it, it's got not quite it's almost the same ergonomic experience i mean the smg is still a little bit better but i do prefer the compression lock i think over the strider's frame lock just positioning right um that's in combination with the, the ergonomics is it's all kind of right there but the thing that pushes it over the edge is you can have this knife for less than half the cost of a strider a lot of people are like oh the shaman's overpriced for what you get, I'm I'm sorry. I I just don't have a problem with the uh, the Shaman. Yeah, I know they bumped the price on it from when the original the original production uh, run, like the one that was much less. Uh, I I still it's less than half the cost of a Strider, and I still I mean for what you're getting, I just think it's amazing. You can pick this knife up down in my uh, my Amazon store under Spiderco knives. Absolutely, I don't think I've missed any of those that I wanted to talk about. Moving on here. To number seven, these are getting harder and harder, guys. So just kind of understand any of these in the last top ten. It's, I mean, they, I mean, almost up to like the last top five. They could almost go in any order. I mean, these knives are so close together. I love them all. So I'm sure there's people like this one should have been above this one. This one should have. Been. Uh, it's trivial. It's trivial to argue that. Moving on here to number seven, the Les George VECP V3. Oh, I, will, I love this knife. Uh, one of the most frustrating things about it is it's just like, it's just not available. Les George, make more of these. Oh my goodness. They have, the best version of this is the one that's available at Monkey Edge every like 40 years. Not really, but they do a Monkey Edge frag pattern where they have like a half, it's like a full bolster, faux bolster in the titanium. And then the back three quarters is all frag textured. Oh my gosh. Amazing grind. Um, very Rick Hinder-esque, very polished, almost has like a mirror polish under the uh, titanium, under the tumbling on the titanium and the tumbling on the blade. And then every last little surface of this knife just feels like it was, it was just polished, polished to this glassy, smooth, yet still functional and very purposeful design. Um, the only thing that I don't like about this is that the jimping is almost non-functional. Literally every other aspect of this design was knocked out of the park. Very simple construction, runs on phosphor bronze, so it's absolutely made to be used. CTS XHP on the blade, and then the titanium handles. And on top of that, it takes up, it's about the same size as an XM18, but it takes up less room, and it weighs less. I just wish it was more available. It's one of the best designs ever, and it's just not available. Moving on here to number six, this was definitely a dark horse, and this definitely came out, uh, out of nowhere. The A Purvis Xerx. Unfortunately, the, the, I could not find a good picture of this knife, on Google. So I just used my own thumbnail. Um, for those of you who don't, or like, you know, don't believe that I've reviewed all these knives, this, this is my own thumbnail. <laughs> the A Purvis Zerks built or designed by Adam Purvis and built by Wii. Um, this is the greatest knife that Wii has ever built, in my opinion. Um, this, not only is this knife like beautiful, but we have contoured, textured titanium scales. 
Um, wonderfully simple hardware, a beautiful compound ground blade. Uh, I mean, everything about this knife screams complexity and simplicity and aesthetic beauty all at the same time. And on top of that, it's perfectly functional. It's also one of those knives that I could just sit around and not just because of the position of the flipper tab or the feel of it, you know, the, uh, the, the, where you put your thumb to disengage it, the fact that it doesn't have a double clutch, it's fun to play with because it got all those things right, but it's also fun to play with because it's just a thing to behold. It's, it's amazing to me that this knife that could easily have passed for a seven or $800 knife just a couple of years ago, uh, was, is being sold currently for substantially less than that. I, I don't know exactly what these run. I want to say they're between Two, I'm going to give you a crazy range. I think it's like 240 to 280, but I'll, oh, it's so worth it. So worth it. These things are awesome. They come in a, a ton of different configurations. Um, you can get the dark tumbled ones. You can get these bead blasted ones, satin ones. There's a whole bunch of stuff. M390 and titanium, absolutely. If you can find one, get your hands on it. They're worth it. Number five, probably the most expensive knife on this list, uh, the Gareth Bull Shamwari. Another one of my own thumbnails because I couldn't find a picture that I thought was well suited considering we have the iPad format here. Um, the only reason that this knife is not higher, these are wildly expensive. The only reason that this knife is not higher on the list is because the means of deployment is a front flipper. And unless you, every single time I did it, like I got it figured out, but I'd be lying to you if I, if I said that it, I eventually got to a point where I wasn't worried about dropping it. Now I was always worried about dropping it. Um, that's the only issue with this knife is that the adaption process to a front flipper, if you're not used to it, is a long and bumpy road. <laughs> and considering how expensive this knife is, it's kind of a constant stress, right? Um, but talk about, in my opinion, and I, I love simplicity and I also love monochromatic aesthetics. So talk about like the ultimate culminating aesthetic experience. I mean, this thing is so beautiful it is so wonderful and it feels better in like you know when you feel you're you you build up something in your mind because of how it looks in pictures and videos and you imagine how it feels and then you get it and it's that rare blue moon occasion where the the feel of it and the look of it are actually better and the combination of it magnifies your enjoyment for it that's the experience i got with the shamwari uh, i'm sure i hope i'm painting a vivid picture this is a wonderful knife it's beautifully executed it is made just as good, if not better, than what you'd expect for the money. Uh, but rest assured, it's very, very expensive. And they are very hard to get. Number four is going to confuse a lot of people and make a lot of people mad. But you have to understand my bias. Number four is ZT's greatest knife ever. This is the ZT0392, a specific version of it. The ZT0392 BLKGRN or Black Green. The reason that this knife is above the last one is because, number one, I'm a gigantic Hinderer fan. I'm a huge fan of Hinderer knives. Back when the actual XM18s and Eclipses were scarce and basically non-existent, Zero Tolerance collaborated with Hinderer to make a special factory custom series of knives. And each different version was a different color scheme. They are actually using Hinderer uh, factory hardware. But these are full titanium running on bearings and have a steel lock bar insert, which is not something that you could get on a Hinder XM18 or Eclipse back in the day. So these knives, which were originally running 390 bucks from the factory, were an absolute grand slam. It was everything that you wanted from the actual Hinder Eclipse or XM18, but in a basically the exact same thing, but it said ZT on it, but they had special custom hardware, um, and you could actually get your hands on them for, in some cases, like less than half the price. Um, so yeah, uh, this is still something that I consider to be one of the best designs out there. It, it still feels, anybody who's got one, they're nodding their heads right now. They feel literally identical to a Hinderer XM18 or Eclipse. It's more so modeled after the Eclipse, but it, it feels, I mean, if you were to close your eyes and hand, if somebody were to hand you this and you had handled an Eclipse, uh, you'd go, oh, this is a full titanium Eclipse, right? The only difference is the grinds, some of them were worn cliffs and some of these were these modified sort of reverse tanto blades that Hinderer designed back and he had some custom XMs that were ground this way. It's not a production grind except in the ZT0392. These are very rare, they are very sought after, they're very expensive now. Ironically, they cost more than an actual Hinderer XM18 or Eclipse. It's still one of the best designs ever. That is a very personal bias thing. Moving on to number three, these are big and a lot of you are going to be able to guess Number three, the Koenig Arius. Um, this knife is almost flawless. Uh, in fact, 
the newest ones with some of the textured titanium, I mean, yeah, it, I mean, it literally, the newest versions of these that I've seen, they tick every box except the whole external stop thing, which a lot of people would make an argument for because of how the stop actually functions, the internal stop on the inside. Um, it's this, it's basically perfect. These last three knives are essentially perfect knives. They are very expensive. You, they're not impossible to get. You can get a hold of them. They do drop more frequently on, on dealer sites. Um, what some people don't like about these is the aesthetic. Some people don't like this sort of hourglass shape. Um, once you have it in hand, it makes sense. It's one of those knives where if, if you're like, I get the concept, I mean, I'm sure it's perfectly executed. It looks like they're well-made. I've heard nothing but good things, but I, I just, I don't know if I can get around the aesthetic, right? Um, once you handle it, that usually sends people over the edge. That, that us that's what it did for me. I wasn't sure about the aesthetic and then I handled it and I was like, oh God, uh, yeah, they're, they're really, really good. Expensive, but very good. Moving on here to number two. I'm sure you guys are thinking, I know what his number one is. What's his number two? That's the mysterious part. Uh, not so fast. Number two is the XM18 three and a half inch Gen 6. Once again, utilizing one of my own thumbnails. You guys know that I love the Hinder XM18. Um, XM18s come in such a massive variety of different uh, models. I mean, there's some, there's literally something out there for everybody. On top of that, you've got um, nylon or PB washers or bearings, whatever you want. It's the new tri-way thing. Um, so you can switch that out. It comes with all the hardware. Uh, the detents have been fixed, so all the flipping action is perfect. Um, the newer ones come in 20 CV, M390, S35VN, 01 tool steel. All right, sure to be more. I'm sure he'll do a 3V variant. There's like eight different blade shapes. You can get tumbled. You can get working finish. You can get DLC. You can get black wash. You can get black stone wash. You can get full tie. You can get as many different anodization pattern or, or colors as you want. There's an enormous, enormous variety of custom hardware that you can get for these. Literally anything you want. The, the, you've heard that they don't cut well, you can get a skinny version of the three and a half inch or three inch, right? You want a big blade, you can get a 24. Literally, there's something out there for everybody. These knives are so well executed, right? Even for the money, even they are expensive knives, but even then, they're still keeping up with the demands of today's knife world. And the fact that you can get literally whatever you want, it just makes me love them all that more. If there was one thing that could make this better, contouring on the scales. That's the one thing. Hinders still have kind of a blocky feel. If they had some contouring, it would add that next level feel and aesthetic that people look for in today's knife world. This is my current one. It is a DLT trading exclusive Fullard Spear in M390 and I have the upgraded titanium scale on it and I love it. Absolutely. Okay guys, number one, a lot of people are like, I know what it is. A lot of people are like, it could be one of two things. And there's a lot of you who are like, I have no idea what he, what he's left out. Well, here it is. Number one, the Holt Spectre V3. I was fortunate enough to handle one of these here very recently, and I was convinced that I would love it, but it wouldn't surpass the XM18 for me. And I'll tell you what did it. I was shocked that it, that it was actually a full-size knife. For whatever reason, it was just the dimensions, me looking at it in other people's hands. I was like, that knife's too small and skinny for me. It's not. It's a full-size knife. Fully flat ground blade, probably the, I mean, it's a, such a simple blade, but it's probably like the most functional EDC blade shape you could ask for. On top of that, they have a perfect combination of micro, uh, like the, the granular structure of the um, surface tumbling and the um, sub-level mirror polishing underneath it. The blade is just, oh, this, this image right here is a really flashy image. And it, you're, you're looking at it through a phone onto, you know, it's, it's recording the screen of an iPad and the image is still coming through. It's like a, oh, it's even better in person. This image is not doing it justice and it's a beautiful image. On top of that, there is no part of this knife that is not purpose built. Something that I left out in my review, it has an adjustable detent. Oh my goodness. It has an internal stop that functions exactly the same way as external stops bracing on the frame because they do that runs on bearings, has completely drop shot action, which is amazing considering the stock thickness of the blade is only about 125 thousandths and it drops down to a razor thin edge. The uh, handle materials, um, titanium, you can do a regular frame lock, you can do a sub frame lock. They have overlay options, as many options as you could imagine from the factory. Almost, if I'm being honest, it's almost uh, you know what Hinderer is doing. Um, there is a waiting list for these. You can't just go out and buy them. 
Um, but once it's your turn, you can essentially customize every last little bit of this. These do have contouring. These do have micro milling. You can get them in feather patterning or you can get them in diagonal, you know, micro milled lines. You can get it in like checker pattern, which is exactly what I do. Um, it's got two T8 body screws and a perfect gear pattern backspacer on the back. Milling on the inside. So you get an 8 inch or an 8.1, 8.2 inch overall knife with a 3.4 inch or 3.5 inch blade. And it weighs like nothing. What does it weigh? Like three to three and a half ounces? Oh my gosh. They nailed it. The Holtz, there's literally nothing wrong with this knife. This is the most perfect folding knife that has ever existed. They are expensive, right? If you go to the secondary market right now to pick one of these up, you're going to pay way too much money. But if you wait in line, if you actually get your name in for one of these and it's your turn, what they ask for them is perfectly reasonable considering what this is. Owners of this knife will know and they will usually not in agreement. I've never heard anybody say that they don't like the whole spectrum, unless you just don't like the aesthetic. If you don't like the aesthetic, okay, that's fine. But if you're, if you're wondering what I think like the very best execution of a folding knife is, yeah, this knife cuts and so does a $2 knife from Walmart, but this is executed better. There's more time. I mean, this is this blurs the line between production, mid-tech and custom. Like this is just, there are $5,000 knives that I wouldn't want as much as this knife. Because when it when you if, if you're in line to get one of these, you will get exactly what you want. I mean, you gotta pay more money if you want some of the more exotic stuff, but this is amazing. Your only your only uh, chance at getting one of these if you're not waiting in line and you don't want to pay an enormous amount on the secondary market, follow them on Instagram and they do lotteries every now and then. You can put your name in and if you win, you have the opportunity to buy one uh, for the for the normal price. So that's what I would that's what I'd recommend. Guys that's that's going to be it. This is my up-to-date 2020 top 20 favorite folding knives of all time list. I hope that this has at least been mildly entertaining to you. I went as fast as I could, still made it in about 30 minutes. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do of course have lots of videos of knives that are either expensive or inexpensive that I do or don't like, so check those out. And if you enjoy all my content, go ahead and click on this metal complex logo right here and subscribe because there's definitely more coming. Thanks again for watching, everybody.